my my colleagues fear for my safety when i travel in certain places up north and all i have a whole army a group of my colleagues and others who come around because you never know who will attack you when so so you have to be very careful uh one, you know once you have become a public face for the defense of the gospel then you have that much more risk the profile with premier christianity magazine you're listening to Premier Christian Radio. I am Sam Hales, and you're joining us today in our London studios. This show is brought to you by Premier Christianity magazine. That is the UK's leading Christian publication. It's the magazine I edit, and it sponsors this show. And I'm really pleased to say that one of our regular writers, the Right Reverend Joseph D'Souza, is our guest on the show today. He is Bishop and Moderator of the Good Shepherd Church of India. He's also the Founder and International President of Dignity Freedom Network, an intercaste and interracial alliance that works on behalf of the Dalits and other marginalised groups. He also leads the ecumenical All India Christian Council. And as I say, he joins us in our London studios today and we get to find out a bit more about his life and faith. Dr D'Souza, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Sam. You're obviously many thousands of miles from home. What brings you to the UK? Uh, I have been here for a series of meetings. I was here for global celebrations with uh, the church at Stan- uh, Stratford and then for um, the Oxford Forum with N.T. Wright on the theme of reimagining global witness in the light of Jesus' inauguration of the kingdom of God on earth, as opposed to the other models that people have used. That's great. Well, it sounds like a very uh, very busy time you've been having here in the UK. Here on the show, we always like to go back to the beginning and hear about a person's early life growing up. So can you just paint us a bit of a picture about your family background and what life was like growing up for you? I, uh, I'm a baby boomer, <laughs> and, uh, the, you know, grew up in South India and uh, like many in my generation in my teens and early years etc uh, was searching for meaning rebellion rebelling against whatever was culture at that time and what was the culture at the time that you were rebelling against uh, yeah uh, the culture at that time was you know uh, questioning everything <laughs> uh, for the youth and uh, it was the era of rock music and uh, Beatles uh, and the and the and the whole of course uh, lots of drugs and everything else uh, it, but in God's mercies uh, I was not dragged into the drug culture thank God I have enough challenges in my life to live out my Christian life and, and didn't want another one and then uh, uh, I've always been uh, a great. Uh, I have always had great interest in uh, philosophy, theology, reading, etc. And uh, was actually preparing at one time, thinking maybe I would go into a career of writing. Okay. And uh, because I loved poetry, I loved the arts, literature, and everything else. But um, when I was 19, 20, and for all purposes, a practicing existentialist who didn't believe in anything, my quest for meaning uh, led me to engage uh, with, the, with the New Testament. Right, okay. Yeah. So you were a very deep thinker at a very early age, looking into philosophy and religion, and you came across, what, you started reading the Bible? Or? No, just the New Testament. Just the New Testament. So, somebody gave me a New Testament and began to read and uh, ask questions. And uh, like so many people at that time, you know, does life have meaning? Does life have a purpose? If there, if there is a thing called salvation, how does it come about? Do you have to be morally very good? Do you have to be 
a monk or uh, you know uh, an ascetic um, all of those things uh, played into my life at that time and to the witness of a friend and a, who himself was a colleague and a student co-student who had come into a life uh, giving experience with Jesus uh, I understood from the New Testament that this Jesus in the New Testament is different and that he is there to offer life you know all through the Gospels it's about you know I've, I've come to give you life and life abundantly what on earth is that? I am the living water. If you drink from me, you will never thirst again. What, you know, what, what on earth is that? And you were spiritually hungry. You were searching for meaning. Oh, yes. Uh, and so you come across Jesus saying, I can give you life to the yeah, full. That must have been appealing. Yeah. And, 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 the cult uh, and people in my culture all over the world were searching at that time. It's my uh, generation that gave rise to the Jesus people in North America. So we were all, we were into all kinds of quests, you know. So some went into drugs, some went into this. But I needed answers. I needed uh, a firm foundation. Mm. Was it difficult to accept Jesus as being the way to God? Because from the little I understand of of Eastern culture and and religion, often there is this sense of there are various paths to God. Obviously, the, the Christian story is one that says where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. W was that a struggle for you just culturally to accept that there was one way to God? Uh, culturally, actually, uh, Sam, uh, the Indian mind is very eclectic. And uh, whereas here in the West, you have such a linear mind, it's black and white, etc., what was more important for me at that time was what is Jesus going to give me and bring into my life which nobody else could give me. So it was more about the authenticity of Jesus than just merely, oh, he's the only way and all of that and run into the kind of... Uh, misunderstanding you run with with Indians or Muslims or Hindus or whatever so so that that was not my big quest my big quest was related to is there meaning to life as I said and I had come to a conclusion which had never settled that life was meaningless and there was no meaning to anything you did you know, and so that's where, when Jesus said, you know, uh, I'll give, uh, when he, you know, when he talks about water, uh, there in the Gospel of John, and he says, you know, I, I, uh, I, I am the living water, and I'll, I'll, and I, I, I interpreted that as there is an inner meaning possible in Jesus, and so. So that impacted me greatly. And then, of course, is incredible love and understanding that he sacrificed himself for me uh, so that he could release me from evil and sin and all of that stuff. Not that I became perfect overnight. Uh, but the whole understanding of uh, is unconditional love, which has been a very dominant feature of my life and work all through the years, that Jesus' love is so different from other loves. And how did your life change? If we can take a snapshot of your life before you became a Christian, a snapshot of your life now, how is it different? Uh, Dam, it, it was very different in that uh, as soon as I gave my life to Christ, uh, without any question, two things entered my life. A certain settled peace. You know, if you may not know this, but during my, my years, one of the most popular books was Peace with God by Billy Graham. 
the, our generation was seeking a kind of inner peace. And Jesus says, peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, but my kind of peace or my kind of joy. So it brought it brought a settled peace to the ups and uh, downs of life. It never has never left me, and it brought to me the incredible gift uh, of joy. Now you know if you are in America, in their constitution they put the pursuit of happiness is one of the big things. Happiness can be here today, gone tomorrow, depending upon circumstances, whether you have money or no money, etc. But joy is possible even in the most difficult and intense. So joy happened to me. Like, you know, the book title of C.S. Lewis, Surprised by Joy. And you were how old when this happened? Uh, I was about 1920. Okay. So you're a young man, and what did you have ahead of you in terms of your ambitions for life? Was there a career plan at this point? Yes, I had a career plan. I was uh, studying uh, chemistry, reading chemistry and uh, maths. Uh, then I later on read uh, theology and communication. And then when I finished my education and sometime in the middle of it I uh, joined the group called Operation Mobilization in one of their ships and spent over a couple of years on the ships going around different parts of the world Asia, Africa and uh, training others, discipling others and also getting a taste of international life. These, uh, for those who don't know, Operation <coughs> Mobilization, OM, as you say, operate these incredible ships, uh, ships all around the world, and they go and they, they serve local communities and they share their faith, don't they? And you were involved with OM to quite a high level, weren't you? Um, in the yes, I was. I was uh, the leader of the work in India and then uh, the Associate International Director for 10 years. And uh, But that was... Uh, the Associate International Directorship was also at the time when in India uh, God led us, me, our movement into the caste revolt and the freedom from the caste system and something that I never expected uh, would be part of my journey into a campaign of justice yeah. let's, and, let's, and reconciliation. Let's talk a bit about that. So the, the caste system, just for those who aren't aware, can you explain what that is and how it works? Because as I understand, this this permeates really a lot of life uh, and culture in India from the little I've read on it. So just, just tell me a bit about what this is for those who haven't come across it before. Two things. It not only permeates all of life in India, it permeates the life of Indians wherever they are. One of the mistakes I think Britishers make, or Americans have made and others make, that, oh, caste system is out there, but there's nothing in Britain. Now, there's been huge debate in your House of Lords and House of Commons over of putting caste as a category of discrimination. One day I think it will happen because you've got lots of low-caste Indians here who are being discriminated by their own uh, Indians uh, because the caste system like the like racism does not operate merely on a black and pink skin you know people use the word white but you are not really white if you look at a white paper and I look at you you're not <laughs> really white but this whole concept of whiteness is yeah. something that we have to re relook and consider and who created it. it was, it's, a, it's a philosophical construct which says white color is superior than you know, everything else. So anyway, but there is the element of color, but the, the caste system is about 2,500 years old and is based on the ideological premise that in creation, God 
uh, created man unequal. Uh, some he put at top of the rung, made them superior. Some a little bit less sup it, uh, down, but still superior. And a whole chunk of humanity, 60% of them as low caste or outcast. And then you have the outcast, which are about 300 million people who have been abused, exploited, etc. So, so it's it's a it's a system. And uh, uh, when we began, in, by, because of the invitation of these leaders to join in their struggle for freedom, and because of their understanding that the gospel of the kingdom of God brings freedom, uh, like most upper caste Indians, educated Indians, I had no understanding of how this caste system actually played out for those who were low caste. And then I got in the middle of this whole thing and in their lives, and uh, I was completely horrified and began to speak on this, raise my voice, did a lot of work during the uh, William Wilberforce bicentennial. We had hearings here. I've written about it, been on all of your major radio st secular stations, uh, and and said this is still going on, and uh, tried to uh, listen to what Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, the Dalit leader, uh, who eventually would write Frame Our Constitution. Uh, wrote to the New York Times in 1937 that it is such a pernicious problem, caste, and man himself will not change it, but nothing less than global opinion can bring it down. Wow. So that was in 1937, and here we are in tw uh, 2022. And do you believe that still to be true? Yes, very much so. The only from international pressure? In, in internal pressure and inter international pressure. Yeah. It has to be a pressure from the black nations too. And the previous human rights commissioner to the United Nations was a South African lady of Indian descent and whose parents were sent as indentured laborers. She understood it. Mm -hmm. So she took on the issue. It feels like there is a global conversation Again, correct if I'm wrong, but it, it feels like particularly since the death of George Floyd, although of course there were conversations about racism before then, it feels like since then there is a, there are certainly a lot of white people now talking about issues of race and racism as a direct consequence of that. And internationally and globally, whether it's the EU or the UN, various declarations and we believe in human rights and, and isn't racism awful, you would think there could be a similar global consensus that in the same way racism is wrong, so is the caste system. Absolutely. And uh, uh, this had to happen in the sense of the revolt against racism. And it was always simmering down there and the death of Floyd, just the dam burst, then he had black lab, and all kinds of reaction to the whole thing. And, uh, and in the middle of all of this, uh, Isabel Wilkinson was at Harvard. Uh, I was surprised actually. Uh, she brought, a, brought out a book, Cast the Root of Our Discontents, and proposed the theory that underlying all kinds of racism around the world is the caste philosophy. And that racism and others are all the flesh and bones uh, that erupt over our bone structure. But the human mind, prejudiced mind, uh, believes in whatever way. In India, it may be four castes. In Kenya, it may be different way. In the West, it may be black and white, does fundamentally believe humans are not equal and their status should be defined by faith. So that book became a major bestseller. And then Oprah Winfrey picked up that book and for the first time she understood because she, she hobnobs with the Indian elite who, t 
who give her a sanitized version of what real life in India is. And then she read that, she was horrified. And then she sent 200 copies or 250 copies of this book to all of the CEOs of the major US companies to make them understand uh, that this is not just an American problem, it is, it is a global problem. And uh, Sam, uh, there are some great global issues of our times. Uh, poverty is one. Neocolonialism or economic imperialism is another one because of which Africa and other nations are so indebted. They'll never be able to pay back the money. And it's just an immoral system that's going on in the economic level. Then you have all this polarization of society and hatred going on. Uh, but with, with humans everywhere, this injustice, great injustice, which the Bible condemns about not seeing every human as being created of the, in the image of God is a persistent problem we have to address and we have to deal with it and take our cues from the Bible. And so that's become a very important part of my life. And uh, so, so when I he heard that, uh, forget the U.S. government, everybody's campaigning for it. Howard University said, in our campus, caste is a category of discrimination. Then another university in Canada decided that. And some university in South Africa decided that. It would be great for Oxford to do it. It would be great for Cambridge to do it. Because where, wherever Indians are, this prejudice is brought. And racism will never be fully dealt if you don't understand what kind of a philosophy this comes from. But you mention it's uh, at root. Could you not argue it is a religious philosophy? Because when you explained the caste system a moment ago, you said it's 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 built on this idea that men were not created equal by God. So the caste system is a religious idea. It is prominent in Hinduism. It is not just prominent in Hinduism. That is the point. I use the word ideological, but if you want a broader word, it is a theological problem. So, But if it's a theological problem, and if it is prominent in another religion, and we'll come on and talk about this. You are a great advocate for religious freedom, for religious liberty, and, and you will argue that a, a Hindu has a right to practice their faith. The problem becomes, but what if, what if Hinduism teaches the caste system? How can we defend the rights of religious people, Hindus, to practice their faith, whilst also saying the caste system is wrong? No, that, uh, this is more complex. We can defend the right right of those Hindus who are within the caste system and feel oppressed, they've tried to reform and they want to get out. Absolutely, we have to defend their right to religious freedom, to choose another faith of their choice, free choice, not by fraudulent mere, or no faith. I've been a campaigner for that now for 30 years. Equally, you know, there will be like there are Christian, you know, nationalists in America and many places who will never give up the idea of white supremacy. But I cannot take away from their their human person if I really believe in religion. If they're wrong, I don't agree with them. Okay, you want to practice your faith, fine. But don't impinge on the freedom of somebody else. Yeah, you draw a distinction between you can, as a Christian, believe in Jesus, but, you know, you cannot be a, be a racist Christian and we will we will stamp out racism whilst protecting your rights to religious freedom. I understand the distinction, but some people have argued that distinction is not as clear in Hinduism, where, where the faith is so intrinsically linked to caste. Are you saying that's not the case, that caste is not intrinsically linked to Hinduism? There are streams within Hinduism uh, that have tr tried to reform uh, themselves because Hinduism is not like the Abrahamic religions. 
though they are trying to make it one, it's, they are not monolithic. But a large part of Hinduism believes in this theory of creation. And they need to reform. And un unless they reform, and reform is possible, but what is the reform that will make them throw this away, just as the reform in the West allowed slavery to be thrown away? Uh, will they have to take a reformist attitude or reinterpret their own scriptures? Mm -hmm. One of the things I was most shocked by in this conversation is actually, you know, before we start asking questions of other faiths, the, the reaction of the Christian church in India to the caste system. And I was reading that actually, as much as I might want to sit here as a Western Christian and say, we as Christians around the world believe uh, that everyone is created equal under God, sadly, that hasn't always been the approach of the church in India towards these people you're advocating for, the, the Dalits who are who are this lower lower caste. Can you explain a bit about that? Yes, because the caste system infiltrates all religious communities. That's why, you know, I'm not allowing a clear black and white distinction. Casteism entered Christianity as soon as it was born uh, 2,000 years ago. Uh, and it's a shame that we have caste in the church. Can you explain how that works practically? Because I, again, I would like to think for most British Christians, they find it hard to get their head around this perhaps because they are in a church where they feel like, you know, we at least try to welcome all. So how does that play out in India where there's, a, there's not this understanding that we're all, we're all equal even within the church? Two, uh, two responses to that. Uh, the first response is it is not true that the Western Church has not had its version of caste within itself vis-a-vis -vis racism, apartheid, and all other stuff. So Western Christianity is not perfect. Indian Christianity is definitely not perfect because the upper caste Christians in complete denial of what Jesus taught, maintain their racial purity. They will not mix with the Dalits. They won't eat with the Dalits. They will never marry the Dalits. So much so, in some parts of India, there would be two graveyards of a Christian community in that area. One graveyard for the upper caste and one... So even in death, we don't... So, so that highlights the deep-seated prejudice. So when an upper caste and a lower caste marry, whether they're Hindu or Christian or Muslim or whatever, man, in India it's a huge thing. Now modernization, technology, education is breaking those barriers. But we need to see a lot more progress with your generation, the next generation, who uh, are impacted by the system and the structures and the ideological framework which the kingdom of God gives us. And the kingdom is about the new creation. The kingdom is, uh, is about the new humanity Jesus Christ came to give. So I've been one of the strong preachers saying, you know, don't just come and tell people, you know, go to heaven and you don't create the new humanity. You're, you're giving them not the true gospel because they continue in, this, in their social sin. Mm -hmm. Galatians tells me that one of the great purposes why Jesus gave his life for me is to unite all human beings under his headship, mm -hmm. him as king, and we all together worship and follow him. Coming back to your story, you mentioned that you were with Operation Mobilization, OM, for a long time, and I think you said during that time started to do a lot of work uh, and, and the car system and Delhi. So tell me a bit more about your time with them and how that affected you personally and what you were doing there. I think uh, the time with them was great. It was formative for the years I was there. I was young. Uh, it exposed me to global cultures, the faith, etc. It's so helpful, isn't it, to 
get a view of what God is doing outside of your own country or culture. It's 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 yeah. an expanding experience. Yes. So that was beautiful and very good, and I'm very thankful to God for that. But at the same time, as I stayed in it, there was a slow growing discontent, and the discontent was, yeah, you're doing great, but this is an organization that happened and came out of the West, out of their own cultural milieu. You are not dealing with the problem of a billion people and their context. Uh, I want you to incarnate, incarnate yourself further. Don't live in a bubble of, you know, many organizations, Krishna, live in a bubble of reality that they create without looking at what's happening outside my doors. So in the 90s, when caste revolt broke out in North India and young people were burning themselves to death, and I was living in a cloistered mission agency, I felt very embarrassed. I said, why is this happening? Why don't I understand what's going on? What does God want me to do, etc.? And I believe it was God now, and everybody confirms that. Whereas before, uh, when I saw the gospel, I saw it one way, but because I responded on the and took up the issue of justice, and you see, justice involvement is not very high in the on the agenda of the church, whether in India or around the world, because we have effectively privatized religion and made it very individualistic. The Western individualistic culture has even penetrated the Indian culture. And so you're very happy if everything is okay with you, but you don't care for what's happening to your neighbor, etc. And here I'm thinking, man, these people are suffering and they're crying out and they come to us and say, we want freedom, we want justice. Then I had to go back to scripture. And I was absolutely amazed. I said, how was I so blind? Because justice is the great theme of the Old Testament. Justice is the great theme of the New Testament. And Jesus is about justice. And then to study more and find out this word righteousness that we have translated, is the, that English word does not uh, fully carry the Greek meaning uh, of the term that is used for, uh, for righteousness, that justice and everything that it encompasses is in that word righteousness. But most Christians, myself included, we had taken that to be talking about self-righteousness. But Bible is talking about overall justice of God putting things right. And so that began a series of changes within our work. And I was the leader of the work in India, and I said, you know, Great, we have had all these years doing what we did. I think God wants us to take another pathway now to impact the whole nation. And we are going to get involved in putting the world right to the gospel of the kingdom of God. And how did that go down? Uh, it was very controversial. It was very difficult. We were accused of and then now it seems strange that we were going to go into politics and we would do this, we would do that, and we would become liberal, etc. Now, 25 years later, uh, everybody is amazed that instead of going that way, it has actually gone the way of the ancient traditional church because we had to find a model of how to do it. So I was up in England 30 years ago in Ireland uh, in a church I spoke and I told this priest, uh, evangelical Presbyterian priest, that this is going on in India. I can't find an answers in the books of the last 100 years and all. And I don't know where to look and all. And he told me, he's the, one of the first ones, he said, you may find some f answers in the Reformation period of church history. So you go and study that. So for several years, I, I mean, I went and visited and studied the whole Reformation and the complex social, political, 
climate and went to the dungeon where Martin Luther was locked, where he translated the New Testament and, and where the thesis was done. So anyway, that, but that didn't still give me the answers. And, but of course, the, that same brother said, they, he said, you will find your answers if you go far enough into the ancient church because that was the church that did justice. And there was presumably no contradiction between fighting for justice and preaching the gospel. There was no, there was no, because there was no contradiction because they understood the gospel as the gospel of the kingdom of God. We understand the gospel of God as personally going to heaven. That's why there was no contradiction. As long as we understand the gospel is about me going to heaven, then you're not going to be worried about other people. The moment you say, no, this is the gospel of the kingdom of God that Jesus has brought on earth, and I'm a part of it, and this kingdom of God on earth, in all of its expression, is going to put the world right to the extent possible. It's not going to be complete. When Jesus comes, it will be fully complete. There will be full right order, and all this thing will go. So there was no contradiction. There was no uh, dissonance in the heart. And I had then a great sense of, again, the continued peace and mind rest that God had not misled me and my colleagues and my church and the, and the parts of the church I impacted and influenced uh, in India and around the world. I mean, yeah. the fact is a whole movement was born out yes. of this. And, and it's very difficult to sum up in a short amount of time what you then went on to do because as you sit here today, you are involved in so many different churches in India. You're, you travel a lot. You're heading up a humanitarian charity, as you say, working with the Deeks. But, but looking, looking back to that point with OM, that must have been quite painful to leave a charity which you were so involved in, as you said, had done a lot of good work and you presented this new, more holistic vision of the kingdom of God and what well, sounds like that was that was rejected and you had to you had to leave. So so looking back, was that painful and and how do you relate to that situation and those people involved in those decisions today? Very painful. Probably suffered a major trauma which has taken years to uh, get. But it was not one-sided in, in, in terms of how it, there was a response. In God's goodness, the founder of OM, who had stepped down by then, George Verver, totally backed us. And he's 84, and he totally backs us now. And there were other leaders who saw what we were doing. And this always happens when change takes place. But there were other leaders who totally opposed it. And you know, uh, we could have done things differently, but right before our eyes, we saw the mighty works of God, signs, wonders, this and that. So we had to then decide, okay, what does God want to do next? And we realized that we had a, you know, a larger vocation as the church in India than we ever thought. Mm. So that's how it moved forward. So what does the average day look like for you now? Average day. When I am traveling, it is lots of speaking, lots of meetings, uh, working with supporters, building relationships, uh, answering questions, influencing thinkers and opinion makers, about the uh, direction things have to take, etc. Uh, back home in India, uh, every Sunday, and during the weekday, of course, I prepare every Sunday, I lead our ancient Anglican service. We have brought the sacraments back to the church life based on the ancient church practice. So we have communion. Uh, we, we have several bishops uh, and then during the weekdays the care of the thousands of communities we care, that have been born out of this who follow and love Jesus uh, taking care uh, of the leaders 
I mean, I got a, such a large group of leaders working with me nationally and internationally. And is this is this Anglican or is we are Anglican? This Anglican yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, we 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 studied a lot as to which there were a lot of invitations to us to join this thing, that thing, and but we felt no, let's uh, let's go the conservative ancient Anglican route because that will meet the needs of our people. Interesting. Tell me more about why that's the case. Because, you see, we are a divided community and divided around around language, caste, everything. But the peoples that are coming to follow Jesus, they want a unified faith. They want a pan-India faith not just for their local area. They want to belong to something bigger than themselves, larger than themselves. And they want to be able for their sons and daughters from one area to marry somebody else from another area so that ethnic caste barriers are broken down. Uh, Secondly, we come from a very deeply religious culture. India is a land of temples. When people leave something, there needs to be a substitute place. You cannot ask them to meet under a tree or in a room. So you have to create places of worship. Then within their own culture, they have their sacramental life, which most free uh, free churches and independent churches have discarded, Mm. not realizing what are the roots of our ancient faith and why on earth Jesus, at least for the Protestant uh, Anglican world, we have the two sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist Mm -hmm. Uh, and why it is important for us to have the Holy Communion. I mean, our people would not feel that they have gone, and this I'm talking about the young people, they would actually now revolt if we tried to remove the Sunday communion service. It's very interesting. I was interviewing someone else, a church leader in the UK, who said that he believes where the church is growing is where there is the sacramental focus and where the Bible is held up as the authority, as the word of God, and where there's no compromise. And he says around the world, if you find churches that are sacramental and they hold to the word of God, that's where growth is. His argument was it's the churches that are trying to be relevant and bring in a smoke machine or lights or whatever. Uh, that he says that's not going to stand the test of time, whereas it's the it's the tradition, it's the sacraments, it's the Bible. And he says those are the churches that are growing. So that's his view. Is that true of your experience in India? Absolutely. Uh, you see, we have a great worship team. We are also charismatic, so there's a lot of uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit are evident. Yeah. And we allow that. But when you, if you walk into our church, you will see the altar there. You will see a big Bible right on top of the altar, which is there 24-7. And when you go on a Sunday, you will see the chalice there. And the, 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 the thing is, our ancient faith and our church fathers have learned so much and built such a wellspring of spiritual life and depth we are fools not to drink from it and then we wonder why our churches are not growing why our young people are leaving oh we need to become more like them actually that's not you know when people tell me about the millennial crowd and they're leaving I believe it is the fault of the church because then I read, oh, they still are, say they love Jesus, they follow Jesus, but they're not getting what they're looking for. In it. And I believe they're right, because what the young people are seeking for, in my opinion, is a deeper commun- connect with the divine and the spiritual, which cannot happen in performance, what I call performance Christianity. You know, because you go there, 5,000 people, big band, and the main thing you see is the performing band uh, and the preacher. 
though the Bible is important, the preacher was never the center of our worship. The center of our worship always was Jesus. So you have the altar, the cross, and we have on one side the Holy Spirit as dove, and then Yahweh in the Hebrew language. And when I preach, I preach from the side. So they're all still looking. I don't occupy the center stage in front of the altar. The only time I go in front of the altar is when we do an ordination or consecration or when I lead the public worship, just to keep everybody going. But they realize we are coming here to meet Jesus. And you see, okay, I might be a great preacher and God maybe has given me a great sense or like others, oratory and all. But in the church, you're never going to find always charismatic preachers. So why should people come to church? Not because they got a great preacher, but they have got the great Lord, the great King coming in. And so I'm not surprised that so many of our people who are coming into uh, fellowships across India are young. It's encouraging to hear. Is it also true, though, that there is persecution of Christians in India? You know, I'm writing about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a bad day for us. We are going through the worst persecution of the church that we have had in our history. It's often the case, isn't it, where the church is growing, the church is persecuted, and those two things tend to come together. Just tell us a little bit about what this looks like for you practically on a day-to-day -day level and some of the pressures that you and your church members are facing. Every day in some part of India, pastors are being attacked. Not only of our group, but other groups. So as All India Christian Council, every day I get WhatsApp messages, emails, this happened, that pastor was beaten, this fellow is arrested, this fellow is in prison, false charges are being made. Uh, in some places, they ransack the church. In some places, they disturb worship services. They come and, and they start singing their songs, which is not allowed by law. And in many places, the local police are conniving with them. And as I wrote, you know, this last Christmas in northern Karnataka, where they, pro they also passed an anti-conversion law, Christians in one district could not have Christmas services. And left, right, and center, we are being accused of engaging in false and fraudulent conversions when it that is not the truth. And we keep on challenging them and saying, show us where there is a forced and fraudulent conversion. So it sounds like the persecution is coming from different places? Yes, it's spread. Uh, and it one area may spark and then another area may spark. And what's motivating it? What's driving it? I think what is driving them is the propaganda that, the first propaganda is that Christianity is not an Indian faith. It's a foreign faith. And when they say foreign, they want to connect us to connect us with the British colonial. Uh, and that's a lie. We are there for 2,000 years. We both know that our faith goes back a, a long time before any, uh, yeah. any British involvement in India. Yes, so that goes a long time. And so that's a lie. We are older than some of these Hindu traditions that are in India. The s second thing is we have an agenda to convert. That's what based on directions from overseas. That's a lie. Um, the third thing, of course, why it's happening is bless the heart of the Indian Christians. We have a large community of practicing Indian Christians. They just don't pay lip service to their faith. They live their faith. And when somebody asks them a reason for their hope, they witness for Jesus. Witnessing is allowed by constitution, not forced conversion, forced persuasion. So Jesus always gives an invitation to people to come, come to him. What are we supposed to do when people are divinely turning to faith in Jesus and finding Jesus and they come to us and say, we want to worship with you. Mm. 
Are we going to turn them out? That is the denial of our faith. That's not. That's a line we cannot cross. Mm. You know. You, s- you said you said a moment ago you're in WhatsApp groups where you're hearing of church leaders being arrested or, or beaten. Have you? Do you fear for your own safety personally? Yes, my my colleagues fear for my safety, and. Uh, when I travel in certain places up north and all, I have a whole army, a group of my colleagues and others who come around because you never know who will attack you when. So, so you have to be very careful. Uh, you know, once you have become a public face for the defense of the gospel, then you have that much more risk. Well, sadly, we are running out of time. But just before we go, I'd love to know. What is your message to British Christians? What can British Christians do to support and love your ministry, the church in India, uh, whether it's through prayer or whether it's through political campaigning? How can UK Christians be a blessing to you and your ministry? Right now, I think that UK Christians should join hands with the Indian Christians uh, in this hour of trial, in prayer and in any way possible. Uh, political campaigning and all does not work anymore outside pressure that is a battle we in India have to fight Uh, so that is what I would urge but at the same time I reverse and as an Indian Christian I'm also concerned for the church in Britain and the Indian British church if, if persecution of some type comes don't be worried God will give you strength and courage to stand for your faith. But the more British Christianity finds its feet in the living Christ and through their lives uh, witness, uh, the revival of the faith in Britain is a big concern of mine. You have been listening to The Profile Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been great to have your company. Please do give us a rating and a review wherever you found this episode because it helps other people to discover the show. We'll have another fantastic interview coming up for you next weekend. Speak to you then. You've been listening to The Profile in association with Premier Christianity magazine.